fishers of men, I'd tell you the number in the chorus book, but you don't have one, so I'll invite you to join me in standing and we'll sing the two verses of fishers of men. I will make you fishers of men, fishers of men, fishers of men. I will make you fishers of men if you follow me, if you follow me. that are in the uh, 55 and older and the 0 to 15 group, you guys were doing great with the motions. You guys that are young and middle-aged, not so well. <laughs> I appreciate you doing the motions. Let's have a word of prayer. Lord, we're thankful this morning for allowing us to come and study your word. We're thankful for the love that you'll gi you give us and you've provided for us, and we thank you for that, and we ask that you be with us as we study your word this morning in Sunday school. Help the, the teachers to present the, the lessons that you've given to them and plan for them. In your name I pray, amen. You may be seated. Let's do a memory verse from the uh, kindergarten four and five. <clears throat> Good. Second and third. Good. Fourth, fifth, and sixth. Good, uh, the youth group. John 10, 27 through 29. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. I give them eternal life, and they will never perish, and no one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father, who has given them to me, is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of the Father's hand. Good, the adult class. Good, I'll invite the other classes to join you in standing and they can be dismissed as we sing the first verse of Fishers of Men. I will make you fishers of men, fishers of men, fishers of men. I will make you fishers of men if you follow me, if you follow me. be seated.
Good morning. Can everybody hear me? I have a problem. I get talking and my voice sometimes goes down, down. I'm in the basement. So if I do that, raise your hand and say, Mr. Cross, <laughs> is there anyone who needs the questions for today? Pastor Norton's passing out the memory vert. Okay. These cards, has everybody received one of these? They have the different things we've studied. You got one? You need one? Yeah. I'm going to take an extra one. Yeah. Keep it by my computer. Anybody else? Yeah. Two? You got it. Oh, you're welcome. You got it. Thank you. <laughs> They'll be on the table back there, so. Well, I trust everybody has remained upright through all this ice, and it's good to see. <laughs> uh, It's a mother eagle feeding the eaglets. I mean, this could be a picture of a robin out in your arboretum, outside in your bush. And there, the little ones are staying at and being fed by mama. Worms, or in this case, probably strips of salmon or a rabbit or something. I chose this picture. It's a picture of being under the word. That's where we're at this morning, under the word of God. Uh, we're not supposed to forsake the assembling of ourselves together, but even more so. This is our time of the devotions at home. This is our reading through the, through the scriptures. We have been, and I want to thank everyone here who contributed to this, this quarter's teaching. It was not easy. Uh, it was outside of what we normally, and some of them mentioned, well, I don't really study the Bible until I have to come up here. And I hope you're not like one of the um, family member. He had to speak. He had to give a devotion. So he contacted his old Navy buddy. Oh, help me with some scripture, a devotional, so I can share with the family. Don't do that. Be into the word. So you got being under the word, and what we've been taught is to be into the word. Very important. Um, what do you think of as Bible study? If you were to put a name to it, let, first of all, Bible study is a joy. I can testify to that. But I learned something about this thing of Bible study is really meditation. John MacArthur, he defines uh, meditation as the cow goes out in the morning and it eats the grass laden with dew, eats it, and then later in the afternoon you see it underneath a big oak tree chewing away. <laughs> There's a farmer or guy. In that. And what they're doing, they're digesting that and getting every bit of nourishment out of that grass. And we only see the benefit on the, on the meat counter. But I learned something about meditation. I want to share it with you. Um, I don't know. This is, this is not... Meditation, as it's found in the, and I'm strictly looking at the Old Testament, the Hebrew, this word for meditation is used 20 times, the majority of times, in the Psalms. I almost uh, was going to 
on the scripture reading up there, going to put Psalm 119 as extra credit, and I took it off. Meditation. It's more than chewing the cud. It is part of it. But this thing of synonyms, read some of them. To ponder, okay, to ponder God's word. To converse with. See, it's not meditation. I always thought it's kind of privatistic, like it's me on the mountain type thing, but it's not. According to the usage of the, of the Hebrew word, declare. Declare God's word. Pray is, is used in it. Speak, talk, muse. Here's one you might not think of. Complain. Let me show you some examples. So, you know, that we start out in the Psalter, the, the songbook of the Old Testament. Uh, Psalm 1 and 2 is not historically placed there. It was done by probably Ezra in the uh, canonization of the Old Testament. It starts out in Psalm 1 and 2, the more Quite, quite evangelistic, quite, I'm going to read Psalm 1. You don't need to go there. I'm going to, this is going to be a whirlwind. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scoffer, but his delight. See, two things, blessed and the delight. This all comes back to joy about meditation. But delights in the law of the Lord on his, way, on his law, on God's law, he meditates day and night. Meditation. Giving thanksgiving. Psalm 119. Oh, uh, there's another in Psalm 19, verse 14. But the meditation of this this spinoff of that word is only used four times, and it has to do with people that are in the singing. I heard Joy singing this morning, and playing the instruments. It has to do with meditating and bring forth music. It's interesting. Uh, I didn't know that. I was talking to Pastor Branham, and he said, "Let the meditation of my heart be acceptable unto you, Lord." That was on Johnny Cash's tombstone. I thought it was kind of, maybe knew something about the use of that word. Yeah, it's real intent. Psalm 119, 15. I will meditate on your precepts and fix my eyes on your ways. Moses in Exodus 33, 11 through 12. Don't go there. This is something I ran across in our Bible reading says that Moses talked with God as a man talked face to face with his friend. And then it said there, he talked about the young Joshua remained at the tent all day long. And then it goes on, he's praying, he's talking to God, and he said, well, show me who you want to go with, you know, take over basically for me. This is at the, you know, the end of his Career. We know it was Joshua. They didn't know that. But then in verse 13, he says, I want to know your ways so I can lead your people. So that's it. Meditating helps us that we can know God's ways. Psalm 119, 23, even though princes set plotting against me, your servant will meditate. And your statutes. Statutes, part of God's word. Verse 27, make me understand the way of your precepts, and I will meditate on your wondrous works. I got a bunch of them here. I'm going to, uh, here's one here. It's my favorite. Psalm 119. My eyes stay open 
throughout the watches of the night that I may meditate on your promises. Have a hard time staying awake? David, they're in a palace and he hears this voice, two o'clock and all's well. He's wide awake, but he's meditating. Meditating on God's word. Um, Psalm 55, 17, evening and morning and at noon, I utter my complaint and mourn and hear and he hears your, my voice. Job 7, 11, therefore I will not restrain my mouth. I will speak in anguish of my spirit. I will complain, meditate, in the bitterness of my soul. And here's one here, Job 12, 8. Or the bushes of the earth, God's talking to him about, look at what the world around you, and they will teach you, and the fish of the sea will declare to you. So teaching, that's what we're doing, we're meditating this morning, in a very real sense. Um... I would have changed these questions a bit. Died. First question, what might some of the reasons we don't love to do Bible study? Go for it. It's work. Yeah. Yeah, it is. Um, and we're going to this is what the whole lesson really. Number two, what unfinished projects do you have around your home and what is keeping you from completion? This is actually, I combined two questions on this. I'm trying to cut to the chase. Boy, you know, I, this could be a, a fractional situation. I mean, I can see the, the lady of the house says, yeah, we got this unfinished project. And the man's saying, this is why we're not doing it. Yeah. Go ahead, Al. I would say that most unbelievers have no interest in the Bible, let alone to study or meditate on it. That's a good point. If, if you don't, if you, if you haven't trusted Christ, you don't care, frankly. Yep, yep, yep. It's hard. It's laborious. Oh, I'm getting ahead of myself. But this is not talking about your house, okay? This is talking a bigger picture, this question, okay? You ever look at yourself as an unfinished product? See, another reason is you may be here this morning and think, I'm finished. <laughs> Pastor Norton shaking his head. He's right. Yeah. We're not there yet, are we, brother? I'd like to get that, that song. I almost ran it off. It's on the internet. He's not finished with me yet. We all could sing that. You know, we had, we're an unfinished house. Um, I'm going to have you turn to Romans chapter 7. Uh, and the first part of it, Romans 8. Please put a marker in there. I got plenty of these you can use for markers. Because we're going to be coming back to this. They went back there a couple times. I think that was. Um, Romans chapter 7, verse 24. This is Apostle Paul talking. He said, Wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? And the question there is, what did Paul call himself in this scripture? Wretched? That's not very nice. Yep. You know, if you look at his background from education, he was an ex-Pharisee. A Pharisee child 
memorized the Old Testament by age 13. But I started with the book of Leviticus. Martha and I just went through reading through. I'm sorry. I, you know. And not only did they memorize it, they memorized the rabbi's writings on it. They're commentaries on the Old Testament. They memorized uh, John MacArthur's, you know, you know. And not only that, is when you had a discussion, they could pull the scripture up and the commentary and put it all together and present it to you. That's his background. And he, he studied at the feet of Gamaliel. He could very easily say, I'm, I'm arrived, but he never did. What did he do? He counted that all but refuse for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ. Romans 7, 25, and I just, I'm going to read just B here. With my flesh, I serve the law of sin. Uh, question, question four. What was Apostle Paul's battle? What was he weary from? One word will get it. Flesh? Struggle with the flesh. You know, the battle of the flesh, when I was here three months ago, we were talking about Ephesians and the Roman, the whole Roman culture, the debauchery, the, uh, I'd love to think that was it for flesh. Because then they could say, I've got it. You know, it's a bigger, it's a bigger issue than that. You know, the flesh, you know, be the red light district. Would it be the Better Homes and Garden magazine, the gun magazines, the, you know, the things that take us away from studying God's word? Not necessarily bad things either. We're going to get into that. Romans chapter 8, 1 through 5. Oh, I love this. There is therefore... Now, no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of the sin and death. For God has done what the law, weakened by the flesh, could not do. By sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, he condemned, he condemned sin in the flesh in order that the righteousness required by the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not according to the flesh. This is the important part, but walk not according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh, but those who live according to the Spirit set their minds on the things of the Spirit and I'm going to jump down to verse 12. So then, brothers, we are debtors not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For all who are led by the, by the Spirit of God are sons of God. For you did not receive the spirit of, by slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons by whom we cry, Abba, Father. So that settles it as far as the flesh. Uh, I'm going to walking in the Spirit. 1 Timothy uh, chapter 4. Keep your finger in Romans there. We're going to come back. 1 and 2. Now the Spirit expressly says in the latter times some will depart from the faith by devoting themselves to deceitful spirits and teachings of demons through the insincerity of lies, 
whose consciences are seared. How does one sear his conscience? Is the question number five. How do you do that? You know, not yielding yourself to the Spirit of God and God's Word, just keep doing it. And it's interesting there, through the insincerity of lies, you keep telling yourself, it's okay, everybody's doing it. I can do this, I can not do that. You know, what do you follow? I, uh, in the spirit of <laughs> Larry Peak, this is my demo. I liked your cup, Don. I really did. <laughs> this is this will pay all in it. Um, years ago, I discovered uh, we were talking about this thing with GPS, and I almost jettisoned using this as an example. But I've got Google Maps. You can plug this in the car, and a screen comes up with a map. You punch, I hit this thing, I got a whole list of places I've been. And places I'll probably go back again. It's got a lot of interesting stuff on here. There's one here that's going to guide me home. Martha and I went on visited her sister up in Red Deer, Alberta, Canada. We were gone for a month. I went over there a couple weeks. Out. And um, when I got time to go home, got out in the truck, plugged this in, and I hit home. And this map come up all the way across from Red Deer, Alberta, Canada to Banfield, Michigan. Showed me the way home. What is that? God's word can lead us home when we're out away from home. But I, I've not done well following this at times. I don't believe it. And it, it updates really good, okay? I, I'll explain that. I, we were coming back from vacation up north, and... Uh, Got to a place called uh, Rosebush by Ithaca. And we were going along, and it came up and said, Turn at exit such and such. Well, that's Rosebush. I don't want to go to Rosebush. I've been to Rosebush. We stopped at Rosebush on our way on vacation when the, when the boys were little. We stopped at a Baptist church in Rosebush. We came in with our travel clothes on. Everybody else was looking like you guys, you know. I felt like a, a cat in a room full of rocking, rocking chairs. But <laughs> anyway, I didn't want to go to Rosebush. So there I go by the exit. And driving along, the traffic pulls down to almost nothing. What it was, it was an accident or something. And, it was, and I'm looking over at the map. I could have went around. I could be up there. I'm, just, I'm here. Yeah. I would be going along, and uh, it'll come up. And, Speed trap. Now look, one of those little icon on the road ahead of me. I don't know how they do that. They sold out some information somewhere. Um, sure enough, you go a little ways down the road, and there's a state trooper sitting there. Do we follow God's word? Do we disbelieve? Yeah. Question six, why is searing your conscience a dangerous way to deal with guilt? I got two hands. I'm going to get you both. Go ahead, fellas. Yes, you still got the guilt. Yeah.
makes you feel good because you, you, you're living in denial, right? Yeah. So you think denial is that river over in Egypt, right? It often leads to deeper sin. You say, I can do this, but the next time it's something, the next you know you're in real trouble. It's a hot iron. Leads, I got places on my body where I've been seared, <laughs> scarred. You can't do it, you can't, can't get rid of the scar. 1 John chapter 2, 15 through 17. Remember, keep your finger way back there in Romans. 1 John chapter 2, 15 to 17. Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the desires of the flesh and the desires of the eyes and the pride of life, those three things, we're going to break them down, is not from the Father, but is from the world. And the world is passing away along with its desires. Listen to this. But whoever does the will of God abides forever. The word world in the Greek is cosmos, orderly arrangement. God's made an orderly arrangement. Last time, there's times that this word is used in a good sense. But in this case, it's an organized arrangement against God. The desires of the flesh, what feeds us, what feeds our appetites, the desires of the eyes, what you see, what you shouldn't see. Pride of life, that's a big one. You know, unless we're going to have pride about good things we do, we're thinking we're really, really something. And that can be a searing proposition. What external, question seven, what external, uh, what things mon monopolize your time and devotion? What external distractions? The world. The world. Yeah, yeah, I like watching stuff on. I spend a lot of time watching the news, the alternative news, what's going on. Too much time there. What it does, it keeps us from having a, wor a word-filled life. You know, it's not, it's not either always bad things either. Um, My, uh, my mother was on her deathbed, and she didn't want to, she hadn't been, seen a doctor in 37 years. She did not go. I called the ambulance twice, and the ambulance driver, she, she told the ambulance driver, get out of here, I'm not going anywhere. Seriously. And uh, a couple nights before she left this world, I, I went up, spent the night, and I said, Mom, I want to talk to you about something. I said, you haven't been with a dad at church. Can't hear you. Can you hear me? If I raise this? You haven't been attending church with dad in a while, because he was in the nursing home at this point, so. And I want to know, and I sit down and I read John chapter 14 with her. I said, no, and I remember when I was young, she Talk to me about Christ. I was just, you know, from the earliest ages. And it was, you know, it played a big part in my coming to Christ. I said, Sharon, I want to know your testimony. And she said, you know, this little girl, I accepted Christ. 
and I tried to live for him all these years. Then she made a statement. She said, but not the way. Don't ever let fear. And I, I said to myself, things. She didn't do anything. Immoral, wrong, raising a family, you know, doing all these good things, you know. But they got in the way of what she should do. Good things. But things, not bad things. James chapter 4, 4 through 10. James chapter 4. James is the pastor of the Jerusalem church. So I suspect the first people who read this were his parishioners. I'm sorry, you were going to say something. <laughs> oh, that was it? Good, thank you. He was, uh, I didn't want to miss him. But, um, I can imagine listening to this, uh, verse 4, you adulterous people. Do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy to God. Or do you suppose it is to no purpose that the scriptures say? He yearns jealously over the spirit that he has made to dwell in us. But he gives more grace. Therefore, it says... God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Be wretched. Oh, wait a minute. That's that word again. Be wretched and mourn. Weep, let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves before the Lord and he will exalt you. Question eight there. What role does grace play in restoring a sin, sinning believer? Everything. It's our way home. It's our way back. Everything. To come back. Now we're going to go back to Romans chapter 7, verse 25. Thanks be to God through the Lord Jesus Christ. So then, I myself serve the law of God with my mind, but with my flesh I serve the law of sin. The question is, who gives believers the power to consistently choose to spend time with the Lord? Go ahead, Phyllis. <laughs> yeah. All three. Yep. Set your mind. The law of God with my mind, but with my flesh. We talked about, Ken Holmes brought out our training our mind, exercising our mind in God's word. Chapter 8, 1 through 5. Like I told you, they, they go through this again. There is therefore no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the Spirit of life has set you free 
in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. For God has done what the law, weakened by the flesh, could not do by sending his Son in the likeness of sinful flesh for sin. He condemned sin in the flesh and in order that the righteousness required by the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not according to the flesh but according to the Spirit. For those who walk according to the flesh set their minds, this thing about our thinking, on the things of the flesh, but those who live according to the Spirit set their minds on the things of the Spirit. So then, brothers, jump down to verse 12. We are debtors, not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh. For if we live according to the flesh, you will die. But by the Spirit, if you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For all who are led by the Spirit are sons of God. For you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into, into fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons, by whom we cry, Abba, Father. I think the answer there to question nine. The Father sent the Son, the Spirit, and Christ's work on the cross. First Timothy chapter four, verse seven. First Timothy chapter four, verse seven. Have nothing to do with irreverent, silly myths. Rather, train yourselves in godliness. Hear this. The question, what does it mean to exercise towards godliness? Exercise towards godliness. To make it a daily goal, to train, exercise vigorously for an event. That was what the Roman world of training, they trained their mind, they trained their body for an event. How about just getting through the day? How about an opportunity to share with a fellow worker or in a setting like this? You know, there's opportunities to teach up here. It's a good opportunity to exercise this. Verse 8, for while bodily training is of some value, godliness is a value in every way, as it holds promise for the present life and also for the life to come. This, this saying is trustworthy and deserving of all acceptance. For to this end, we toil and strive because we have our hope set on the living God who is the Savior of all people, especially of those who believe. The question is, what characterizes the work that is necessary to develop godliness? Somebody came really close to this earlier. No, no. It's laborious. You know, I say that, but we live in a time when there's so many things helps. And I almost thought about, I could plug this in and I could show you in real time on the screen how to go through the Strongs without your magnifying glass. And when you get all done, uh, if 
you can hit print and make it part of your Sunday school lesson. It's all done. Maybe some underlining. And it helps to cement that in your thinking. Laborious. But it's joyful. It really is. Philippians chapter 4. We're starting with verse 4. Philippians chapter 4. Apostle Paul writes this to the Philippian believers and to us. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again I say rejoice. Let your reasonableness be known to everyone. The Lord is at hand. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. Let your requests be known to God. Verse 7. And a peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. The question, um, why is God's peace beyond all understanding? Why is the peace of God beyond all understanding? Go ahead, Alice. We don't have the ability to comprehend. No, no. And also because it is the peace that comes when there doesn't appear to be any hope for peace, and you reason without peace, you can't have peace that comes from God. Yeah. You know, even for other believers sometimes, it's when you're going through a hard time, and you're not falling apart. One of the things I... Go ahead, Phyllis. I, it defies life circumstances and shows us how to have grace and confidence in our God. Yes. Yes. I got one thing down here. One of the reasons it's hard to understand for the people, the larger audience, it's because the world didn't give it. They don't understand it because they, they don't know it. They don't, they, and you don't get it out there. You get it from God's word, from relationship with God, through God's word. John 14, 27. This was in that passage I read my mother. John 4, you don't need to turn. I'm, this is peace I leave with you. My peace I give you, not as the world gives you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. Peace of God. Philippians 4, verse 10. Also, Paul writes here, I rejoice in the Lord greatly that now at length you have received your concern for me. You were indeed concerned for me, but you had no opportunity. Not that I am speaking of being in need, for I have learned whatever situation I am, am to be content. I know how to be brought low, and I know how to abound. In any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. And here's a verse we've visited before. <laughs> you hear this a lot. And he says, I can do all things through him who strengthens me. I think of Paul when he picked himself up out of a rock pile and walked. And the night he was in the Philippian jail, 
with Silas, beaten and singing praises, counting all joy to suffer for Christ. I apologize for the little advertising on there. Mike told me if I had paid a royalty, I could have got rid of the writing on there. Well, you know, we went from under the word. We've received tools, instruction on studying God's word. Here's an eagle. How many see eagle around their, this area, around your home or anything? I've yet to see one in this. We visited Paul Pearson uh, years ago. And we were getting ready to leave. We were walking out the door, and he said, you know, there's a lake across the road from him, and this eagle. He said, I'm watching this eagle. And he went down, grabbed a fish, went off with it. I wanted to get a picture with the fish in the talons. Uh, didn't do it. I, we, we went from under the word, this picture, into the word. What we're saying is, get your fish and feed. Develop tools, the, the, what you need from God's word, so you have something to share, so you can grow in your Christian walk, to meditate, to spread it out to others. The question... Uh, what was Paul able to do because he had learned to put his faith in God? Rise above the circumstances? I'm sorry, what? All things. You know, not only his daily circumstances, but he had people that left him and didn't walk with him anymore. Here's a couple things. I, Paul was able to use, be used by God to reach his world with the gospel. This morning, uh, God has used him through the, through the scriptures as far as bringing it to us. We've, we've read much of the scripture and been strengthened this morning by... God has used him to bring up you most of what we've read this morning. Was the inscripturation of God's word. Any anything on what you've learned this past quarter and any any parting comments or anything? Well, You've been very attentive. I'm going to close in prayer. I'd pray that God will use the meditation of our heart and help us to consistently study God's word. Let's bow in prayer. Dear gracious Heavenly Father, we bow before you and understand that in so many ways, we have failed, but I realize your grace is sufficient. And so many times we have come uh, with our time and walked away without putting extra effort, extra time. May we grab a hold of these truths so we are not delinquent. Help us to be ones who are into the word, and not just the devotionals, not through, but that we search like the Bereans, because we are noble, and we want to know. We have questions about your word, and we want answers, and you will give them. They're out there many times. We just thank you for this time, and may it bring Honor and glory to your name. Amen. Thank you.